Hello, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Bill Cosgrove. I'm a Cyber Warfare Officer, a part of the Headquarters Space Operations Command, and I'll be giving you the mission brief today. Next slide. So we'll just start off with some words from the uh, Chief of Space Operations, General Salzman, and I'll just draw your attention to the middle of the slide with a quote when it references a resilient, ready, and combat credible space force. Here at Space Operations Command, that is our bread and butter. Ever since the advent of nuclear weapons, the primary focus of our military has shifted from winning its nation's wars to deterring our adversaries from starting a war in the first place. They have to know that our nation's military will finish the war that they start. And Space Operations Command here, we are the operations arm for the service in order to provide combat capabilities for U.S. Space Command. And just at the end sentence here, it references that will be indispensable in the joint fight. The services that we provide are critical to joint operations here at Space Operations Command. Next slide. So just go over some of the space contributions uh, that, we, that are provided today and how inculcated space operations is to our national interests, whether that's banking, ATMs, the stock market, all of these things are underpinned by services that the United States Space Force provides, in particular through GPS. The position nav and navigation are the backbone for things like Google Maps and, and Waze. If you were to peel back that sticker, underneath it you would see United States Space Force because th those are the services that Delta 8 provides underneath uh, their, their PNT mission. But in addition to that, the timing piece is just so critical to all the other services that I mentioned previously. The, the banking, the ATMs, gas pumps, all of those things are underpinned by the timing that's provided there. Additionally, satellite communication services and just the freedom of navigation of space operations are what we defend every day so that our commercial partners like Starlink, these services are able to navigate freely in an uncontested domain. In addition to the, the national interest piece, from a warfighting perspective, position munitions are so critical to how we fight today, as well as blue force tracking and um, all these other services. If you were to rewind the, the clock back to World War II, it usually took about a thousand aircraft in order to take out a particular target set. Each aircraft has 12 uh, airmen on board, so that's about 12,000 people to take out one particular target set back in World War II. Nowadays, we do that with a couple B-2s and some reachback support, so probably about 10 personnel in total. So you can just see how exponentially our combat capabilities are increased by the capabilities that the Space Force provides in order to be able to do that. Next slide. What you're looking at now is just a qualitative assessment of the tensions in the space environment over time. Strategic competition is just baked into everything that we do. My chart starts in 1985, but if you were to look to the left, you'll see that in 1957, when Sputnik launched, the Soviet Union beat us with the first object in space, the first man in space, the first woman in space, the first animal in space. We ultimately ended up winning the space race with putting the first humans on the, on the surface of the moon, but our space history competition has just been baked in through the beginning. 1991 is another critical point because at that point the Soviet Union collapsed and could no longer fund its space operations. So we entered this unipolar world where the U.S. was uncontested, certainly in the space environment as well as others. And additionally, Operation Desert Storm also kicked off that year. Operation Desert Storm allowed us to showcase what joint operations really meant combined with space operations and that precision guided munitions meant that our weaponry was pinpointed to a particular point to limit collateral damage. Blue force tracking ensured that all of our personnel were tracked on the battlefield. Satellite communications meant that we could be able to communicate with each other and rapidly uh, increase the decision making cycle. So these capabilities really just changed the way that we operated and, and fought as a joint force and our adversaries studied that war in particular for the years that followed. 2007 uh, was another critical point because there was a, the launch of China's anti-satellite missile, which created 3,500 pieces of debris. Those pieces of debris are still in orbit today, many of them, and the International Space Station has to navigate with those on a regular basis. Uh, why that's also so critical is because it meant that we could all, no longer ignore the threat that's coming out of China. So in the years that followed, there are many other capabilities that you could see along the chart that were introduced that created more and more contesting of the, of the domain itself whether that's China's SJ-21 satellite, which has a robotic arm, which allowed China to do on-orbit servicing with their rendezvous proximity operations that that satellite was able to provide, drastically extending the life cycle of, our, of their satellites. 
or certainly the capability enables them to be able to do so. But largely today, our satellites, their life cycle is based upon how much fuel it's able to have on board. Once its propulsion ends, essentially the, the satellite becomes functionally dead. So a capability like that is really a game changer in the space environment. Additionally, with that robotic arm, they could, instead of creating thousands of pieces of debris, just create three different pieces of debris by cutting off your satellites and another, yet another functional kill. Lastly, on that same mission, the Chinese demonstrated that they grabbed onto their defunct satellite that they were working on with that um, SJ-21 and then flung that object into a graveyard orbit. So essentially changing the orbit of, of the, the target asset that it was, it was trying to make actions upon. So you can just see the capabilities that these, these provide um, that our adversaries are going to, to challenge the domain. Russia uh, developed a nesting doll satellite which essentially was a satellite that birthed a smaller satellite to track onto an adversary target, a U.S. adversary target from which it was designed, and then essentially would birth yet another object which would make kinetic contact with uh, a U.S. satellite and then do a kinetic kill on orbit as well. So these capabilities just drastically change the environment and make it much more hostile than certainly it was before. Uh, lastly, I'll just draw your attention to the bottom of the chart which references the total amount of objects that we're able to track. You can see there are about 45,000 objects almost that we're able to track today. There are three reasons why that, it, that is. First, the commercialization of space. So we've got constellations like Starlink and OneWeb, which are telecommunications uh, satellites, which are launching thousands uh, of objects into orbit, drastically increasing the amount of objects that are up there. Starlink alone uh, launched over 1,000 satellites so far in uh, 2023. The second reason is due to the congestion and contention of space. The breakups that I had mentioned previously between China's and then Russia's in 2021 that created another 1,500 pieces of debris, as well as several other unassociated breakups, drastically increase the hostility of the environment. And then lastly, our ability to upgrade our sensors and upgrade our systems have enabled us to track smaller objects than we could once previously do. Next slide. So for my next chart, we'll just go over the evolution of the United States Space Force. In 1946, General Henry Hap Arnold commissioned the first study the Department of Defense ever commissioned with the RAND study. It was to look at the effects of a Earth orbiting satellite and what that could do for military operations. So just to show you how long we've been thinking about space operations, it's been for a very long time, even before the birth of the Air Force, which came up in, in 1947. Additionally, moving on, you'll see that in 1958, we launched Explorer 1, which was the U.S.'s answer to Sputnik, and as opposed to Sputnik, which was a satellite that just emitted a radio beacon as it ran around the, the Earth, Explorer 1 actually had an ISR platform on board to provide intelligence uh, back down to the ground for us to be able to, to action upon. So you can just see that we're using space in a way that is absolutely beneficial to the way that we do operations for, again, a very long time. Moving off to the right, in 1982, we established the Air Force Space Command, and uh, that continued up until 2019. But in 1985, we also stood up United States Space Command, which is a combatant command that we have today, but was taken down in, in 2002. But the reason for that, in 2001, January 2001, the Rumsfeld Commission was a study done by Congress in order to evaluate space operations across the government, and particularly the DOD. And what they concluded was a couple things, the first being, that we were not organized appropriately in order to conduct space operations. And what they recommended was that we stand up a independent space corps underneath the Department of the Air Force. Uh, and we were actually on that path for a good nine months from January until September. And then uh, the events of September 11th happened, 2001, and our nation decided it needed to shift its focus rightfully to focus on the homeland. And as a result, uh, we stood up U.S. Uh, NORTHCOM. And at the time, Congress only allowed us to have nine combatant commands. So we stood down U.S. Space Command and transitioned those services over to, that responsibility rather, over to Strategic Command. And U.S. NORTHCOM stood up. But it wasn't until 2019 when President Trump penned his letter to tell the service to start standing up a uh, Space Force. We stood up U.S. Space Command again uh, back up as well as a service and the NDAA that followed that year. And then finally, Space Operations Command stood up in, in October of 2020. Next slide. So just to go over briefly the field commands that are across the service, 
Space Operations Command on the, the far left, our job is to uh, generate, present, and sustain space war uh, fighting services. Space Systems Command in the middle there, their focus as our lead acquisition agency is to do life cycle management for our satellites. They also have a launch mission in order to acquire, build, and then launch satellites, and then once operational acceptance happens, that is passed over to Space Operations Command. Lastly, you've got Star Command, which is a best practice that we pulled over from the Army, actually. Their TRADOC model uh, actually incorporated not just the training aspect, the initial skills training, acquisition training, but that AETC does kind of today. Uh, we pulled over doctrine development as well as initial qualification training for weapon systems. So those are all underneath the purview as well as exercises. Those things are all underneath the purview of, of our SARCOM. In the top left, you'll see our component field commands, which are relatively new. One in Indo-PACOM, one in CENTCOM, and then one in Korea. These are equivalent on the Air Force side to our, say, PACAF or uh, USAFE. These organizations that are major commands are our field commands, directly focused on supporting a particular combatant commander or, or that particular AOR. So more will follow in the years that, to come, but for right now, these are the three that we have stood up and established. On the top right, you'll see a chart that just shows our structure. The intent here is just to focus on our levels of leadership here. So you can see we have a squadron, a delta, and a field comm. As a service, we wanted to be more lean and agile than we were as, a, as an Air Force. So we combined the field command level from the, the major command level and the numbered Air Force level from our Air Force heritage. And on the delta level, we combined the group as well as the wing and then made it into a delta. The intent here is to cut out bureaucracy, be lean and agile, and you do that by cutting out layers of leadership. Okay, next slide. The Spock mission statement is to protect America and our allies in, from, and through space, now and into the future. This mission statement, as a guardian myself, really resonates with me in that it was partly the reason why I joined over uh, to join the service, in that the optimism, the hope, the potential for change and the future are, are things that, that called to me and it calls to Space Operations Command, which is why they put it into their mission statement. So that we're focused on not just the fight tonight, but the fight tomorrow as well and the, the potential for things to change and be agile and, and lean and innovative in order to do all of those things. Our vision statement is America's space warfighters, always ready, always innovative, and always above. Via Vincimus, the way we win is our motto as well. Next slide. Our three priorities, General Whiting likes to call these our, our four Ps, protect being the first P, and our, our next three here on the slide as you can see, the first being preparing. We prepare combat ready, ISR led, cyber secure, space and combat support forces, empowered, diverse, and a healthy warfighting culture. Combat ready, because space operations is our bread and butter, that's our focus. Uh, ISR led being that everything that we do is driven by intelligence. Um, our, our intelligence brethren tell us what the adversary is doing, what the threats are, and then we develop countermeasures in order to, to combat those threats and deter our adversary. Cyber secure is just so important and really the soft underbelly of our space operations in that the cyber domain and the space domain are so linked together. An adversary like North Korea or Iran who, would, who doesn't necessarily have the capability to challenge us in space would much rather do that in the cyber domain because the cost for entry is significantly lower and attribution is significantly harder. So our adversaries are testing us every day in the cyber domain, which is why it was so important for uh, cyber guardians to come over to the to Space Force and integrate into our how we do operations. Partnering as our second priority. Partnering is so important across the Space Operations Command because space is a team sport. In our headquarters alone, we've got uh, Canadians and Australians. All across our Delta, we've got uh, sister nations integrated with our operations, like at Space Delta IV, uh, where your crew commander could be a Canadian or an Australian or someone from the Great Britain, uh, at leading teams of United States Space Force Guardians uh, doing uh, missile warning missions. So partnerships is just so important uh, to the Space Force. And lastly, uh, we project combat power as a field command that presents forces to uh, combatant command, in this case, U.S. Space Command. Our focus is to prepare and project forces to, the fight, to be able to fight tonight. Next slide. Our leadership, as you can see there, General Whiting as our commander. Our senior enlisted leader is Chief Lloyd. And then we've got three uh, deputy commanding generals underneath him, one for support, one for operations, and one for transformation. 
again, another thing that we borrowed from the Army in that they use, at their headquarters level, they use a uh, model called Deputy Commanding General Model. Much like a, a traditional J staff, uh, we just took these areas that were most t likely together and binned them into these three DCGs. For support, one, four, and eight are binned together uh, to be able to provide support across the command. DCGG is for transformation. Typically, the S9 just does analysis, but to say that they just do analysis completely undersells their operations. They're inculcated in everything that we do for, for innovation, for uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, to just really, again, try and innovate in a quick way uh, for our guardians across the command. And then lastly, all of the other pieces underneath our Deputy Commanding General for Operations. Next slide. Now we'll take a moment to go over the organizations within Space Operations Command. I'll start with uh, the top right, the Combined Force Space Component Command Commander. Uh, that is General Chess currently at uh, Vandenberg Space Force Base. And these are authorities that are delegated to him on behalf of United States uh, Space Command in order to conduct operations and uh, oversee the Combined Space Operations Center organization. Moving on to the left, Space Base Delta 1 and 2. These organizations are the fuel for our operations. Uh, we like to say that JP-8 fuels the United States Air Force, just like HVAC and power fuel the United States Space Force. Without them, we wouldn't be able to operate. These organizations are led by uh, a Space Force officer, but are about 95% manned with Air Force personnel. We need them to be able to do our operations. They're absolutely critical to the way that we do, do things. And it enables the Air Force to provide services to the Space Force while Guardians, we're, we're able to focus solely on operations, much like our Marine Corps counterparts, supported by the Navy. Moving on to our Deltas, Space Base Delta II being our Space Domain Awareness and Tactical Battle Management Delta. They manage our space catalog. So uh, I mentioned before, 45,000 tracked items are, are in orbit right now. They're the ones who build that catalog and then do conjunctive analysis to be able to report uh, what objects are potentially going to collide with others and then report that data to the entire world, to our allies, but not just them, to commercial partners, to our adversaries. We want everyone to know uh, what we know in this environment because when it comes to the objects that are in orbit, so that they can make a determination whether or not they want to move their objects. We want to avoid more debris generation, and, and this is our way to be able to do that. Space Delta III looks much like our other sister services when it comes to how forces are employed in, in the joint fight. They get ready for deployment. They'll go downrange and they'll, they'll deploy and set up their antennas, conduct their electromagnetic warfare mission downrange, then they'll either be replaced uh, by another team or they'll swap out or uh, pack up and come back on stateside. Space Delta IV provides missile warning. This is a very unique capability in that we are the only country in the world that has this particular capability to be able to detect launches anywhere around the world and not only identify them but then be able to uh, report where they're potentially going before they can touch down onto the, onto the ground. Very, very unique mission. If you were to recall, in 2020, there was a couple launches of some missiles at Al-Assad Air Base from Iran. The folks at Buckley Space Force Base on the Ops 4 for uh, missile warning were able to detect those launches within minutes, or seconds rather, and then report that data to the folks at Al-Assad so they can get their people out and there were no casualties uh, or deaths as a result. So really critical capability, uh, unique uh, to our service and, uh, and our country, and just really pivotal work that they do over at Delta IV. Delta V manages the Combined Space Operations Center, and they do command and control of the, the, the space domain. And they prioritize all of the requests coming from combatant commanders on behalf of United States Space Command, and then task organizations to be able to provide the capabilities or effects that are being requested from downrange. Space Delta VI does cyber defense as well as manages the satellite control network. Our mission defense teams pr try and protect and defend our key weapon systems. They're embedded in each one of the deltas, so while they're headquartered at Shriver Space Force Base underneath Delta VI, their organizations are co-located, many of which on the ops force for the operations that they support, and their jobs are to defend, do the cyber knife fight, war fight, on weapon systems to support our operations. 
the satellite control network is a network of antennas around the globe that enable space operators to talk to their satellites. It could be to either move their satellite, point their satellites in a different direction to be able to provide a different effect, or receive data back from their satellites to know that it is working appropriately. Moving on to Delta-7, Delta-7 does a tactical level intelligence gathering. They, again, much like Delta-6, or an organization headquartered in Delta-7 together, and then they have organizations across the globe co-located with the operations they support, providing tactical level intelligence to our space operators. Space Delta-8 does navigation warfare and satellite communications. I mentioned previously about the GPS constellation, and uh, position navigation and timing. This is our delta that does that, our largest delta. They also do satellite communications. An organization, or rather a capability, that uniquely came from the Army and the Navy. So a lot of our, our former sister service, former Army and uh, Navy personnel in that organization, because as you would imagine, if you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on a ship and you need to be able to talk off ship, well, how else would you do that other than satellite communication? So exquisite experts in what they do, and we're glad to have them as part of the team. Delta-9 does orbital warfare. Delta-9 has a protect and defend mission on orbit. They have a capability called GSAP, uh, which does a, a essentially a neighborhood watch around the, the geosynchronous orbit uh, to be able to identify adversary activity in that area and characterize threats. Space Delta-15 also does command and control, much like Delta-5, but Delta-15 is focused on the protect and defend mission underneath the National Space Defense Center, which is the Air Force's contribution on, on behalf of the DOD to largely a intelligence community um, organization with NRO and NGA and all of those other organizations. So they come together underneath the National Space Defense Center, and Delta-15 is the Space Force's component for that. Lastly, Delta-18 does long-term intelligence gathering and, and reporting. So uh, they are our National Space Intelligence Center, much like the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, uh, NASIC. They're both co-located at, at wright Pat Air Force Base, but every service has a national intelligence agency, and Delta-18 is ours. Their focus is not on the tactical level intelligence, uh, what's happening right now, what's happening tomorrow, which Delta-7 focuses on, but Delta-18 focuses on what's happening in the next 5, 10, and 15 years out so that we know how to prioritize our funding, our capabilities, so we're planning for the future based on what the adversary is doing. Next slide. So we'll go over a little bit on the headquarters now. So I mentioned previously, Deputy Commanding General for Support, Operations and Transformation. Underneath support, we have a Mission Support Integration Office. We tried to organize the headquarters to be a one-stop shop for all of our, our deltas, our, both our, our mission deltas and our, our space-based deltas, so that they had one place to go and it became less confusing as to who to uh, coordinate, focused on what their current operations are and how to support them now, and then again, how to support them in the future. DCGT focuses on AI, ML, innovation, all of the things, industry partners are allies, international partnerships, that's, that's their focus. Um, again, much larger than a normal uh, S9 would be uh, in order to try and focus on the larger innovation effort. And then lastly, operations has mission area teams, which I'll go over in a moment. We'll go on to the next build, and we'll talk to uh, about a little bit more about the mission support integration office. So this is that one-stop shop for Space Delta-1 and Space, Space Delta-2 to go to in order to get support. Work very closely with Air Force IMSC in order to provide funding they need for infrastructure on our installations. Next slide. Underneath DCGO, we have all of these mission area teams. Uh, as you can see across the slide here, we've got organizations or at least mission areas across the board to be able to support our, our deltas. Again, a one-stop shop for our delta commanders to be able to go to in order to have their equities in mind at the headquarters. Next slide. And what we'll show you, one more build here, is that each one of our Delta commanders has maybe one or two places to go, again, to make the environment in the headquarters a little bit less confusing for our commanders in the field. Next slide. So, Space Base Delta-1, headquartered at Peterson uh, Space Force Base, uh, but they support much more than, than just Peterson. Uh, Schriever, Batific, Cheyenne Mountain, as well as many, many other organizations they support as well. And then next slide, Space Base Delta II, headquartered at Buckley, as well as support the missile warning mission, so organizations stationed at Buckley, as well as around the world as well. 
Space Base Delta-1 and Delta-2 provide the infrastructure support for our installations. Space Base Delta-1 headquartered at Peterson and Space Base Delta-2 headquartered at Buckley. Next slide. Space Delta-2 headquartered at Peterson provides space domain awareness and tactical battle management. Space Delta-2's mission is defined as space domain awareness. We have a lot of things up in space. Space domain awareness is knowing where all of those things are so that way we can maintain the missions of the active items while avoiding the debris and the junk. There's two different ways to track what's in space. You can use a radar or by looking, but the thing is things are too far away to look at, so we have to use telescopes attached to computers. The way the Space Force is aligned, over 90% of all the other Delta's missions can't be done without what Delta II provides for SDA. We interact with Space Delta III with their electronic warfare mission by giving them accurate states of objects they're interested in. We interact with Space Delta IV the most because its missile warning radars also provide space domain awareness data to us constantly. We interact with Space Delta VII because Intel drives all operations. Delta VIII, they have on-orbit assets. We help them refine knowing exactly where their satellites are. Space Delta IX being orbital warfare, they, just like Space Delta III, need our information for them to be able to know what objects they need to be looking at. Space Delta II is the foundation of space superiority. Space Delta III, headquartered here at Peterson Space Force Base, provides space electromagnetic warfare. The mission of uh, Space Delta III is to provide space electromagnetic warfare to the combatant commanders. And essentially what that means is utilizing the electromagnetic spectrum to either protect our capability to use space or deny the adversary's use of space. The electromagnetic spectrum, or EMS, is uh, basically everything that makes up what we see, what we hear. So that includes visible light, as well as radio waves, to the sound of my voice going to you. That all travels utilizing the electromagnetic spectrum. Delta III physically operates out of Peterson Space Force Base, but we do have expeditionary missions. Uh, we actually send people and equipment downrange to actually provide our mission and our effects to combatant commanders all around the world. Nothing happens without the electromagnetic spectrum, and we actually have that at our fingertips to be able to manipulate. Space Delta IV provides missile warning, and they're headquartered at Buckley Space Force Base. Space Delta IV, in a nutshell, is responsible for missile warning and missile tracking across the entire enterprise. We are the all-seeing eye uh, looking for missile threats that impact the entire globe, not just North America. Space Delta IV has uh, a myriad of weapon systems to enable their mission. The one that people are most familiar with is the space-based infrared systems, which is our on-orbit assets that peer from the heavens down to the Earth. From our terrestrial base, we have two specific weapon systems, the upgraded early warning radar, uh, as well as the, the parks radar up in North Dakota that perform those terrestrial-based uh, sensors looking from the ground up. So the geo assets look from the geo belt down at the Earth, and then our ground-based assets are looking from the ground to the sky, and we see everything in between and characterize it and see if it's a threat. Space Delta IV is headquartered at Buckley Space Force Base, Colorado. But then we have our uh, upgraded early warning units uh, across the perimeter of North America, uh, as well as Greenland uh, in the United Kingdom, and then we have satellite relay stations on almost every continent. Space Delta V, headquartered at Vandenberg Space Force Base, and they provide command and control. The mission of Delta V is to bring the right effect to the right place at the right time. So essentially, to get your space effects, you need to call the CSPOC. Delta V is the 911 of space. A combatant commander can call asking for some sort of space effect, ranging from MILSATCOM, GPS, OPIR, it could be anything. So the orders come in from combatant commanders through a space support request, and then the CSPOC would fill that request through a space tasking order. And so those tasks go out to the units to perform those effects. Del 5 physically operates from Vandenberg Space Force Base. When a combatant commander needs an effect, we bring that effect to them. Space Delta 6, they are headquartered at Shriver Space Force Base and they provide cyber defense and space access. 
The Delta Six mission is to secure our cyber capabilities in space. So when you think about your home computer, you have an antivirus on there, maybe you've heard of McAfee or Symantec, that protects your, your home computer. Well, some of the mission systems are too old or specialized, they can't have new technologies on them to secure them. So what they have is a mission defense team, they have us here in Delta Six to look at the systems on a granular level and say, that looks wrong and that looks wrong, but this is okay. It's something that we can't really automate yet because, again, the systems are very old. The weapon system for Delta-6 uh, is our defensive cyber operation tool suite. We use that to look at logs, uh, search for malware, and hunt for any malicious activities that might be on any of the space networks that we have purview to. In addition to those defensive operations, Delta-6 operates the satellite control network. The satellite control network allows the satellite operators across the globe to talk to their satellites. They can both send commands to move or direct it to look at something. And they can also receive data back to know that their satellite is working properly, doing what it should be, uh, and where they would like it to be. If you think about the basics of everyone else, it relies on computers and cyber operations. We are defending that. We are defending the core component of everything. Space Delta 7, headquartered at Peterson. They provide intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Delta-7 is the Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Delta. Right. Many years ago, space was, was still kind of considered a benign environment. Where the only thing we worried about really was either space weather uh, or uh, safety of flight, right? Not running into each other. Um, but today, our major adversaries have put things in orbit, or doing things in orbit, that hold our capabilities at risk. And that's where we come in, is to understand the threat, to enable our operations, continuity of operations, understanding what's going on so that we can react accordingly. Space Delta 7 has a myriad of different intelligence uh, collection systems that we operate that leverage both organic capabilities that we, the Space Force, control, as well as uh, leveraging our national mission partners across the intelligence community. So Space Delta 7 is uh, kind of unique in that we force present detachments of personnel to every other Space Delta. And their role is to provide intelligence support to both the Delta commander that they're supporting, as well as the operations uh, teams that they're, they're embedded with. But we also collaborate across all of our uh, additional forces within Space Delta 7 to ensure that we are working together and not against each other. Intelligence is incredibly vital to our daily operations because it really is uh, feeding all of our decisions now. Space Delta 8, headquartered at Trevor Space Force Base, provide navigation, warfare, and satellite communications. So the mission of Delta-8 is twofold. Uh, the first part of that is position navigation and timing, or PNT, and the second part is satellite communications, or SATCOM. So when we think PNT, uh, the basic thing is GPS. The first part of that, of course, is that position and navigation. That's what we think when we go to our Waze app and we're trying to get from point A to point B. Uh, but the third part of that is the timing. That's how we sync anything from an ATM to accuracy of dropping munitions. The other side of the Del-8 mission is the SATCOM mission. Think somebody on one side of the globe trying to communicate with somebody on the other side. Of course, we have landlines, but in a wartime environment, that may not be the most optimal. Uh, so really just being able to pick up the phone, connect to the satellites that then take that uh, message to somebody else. Without the effects that we're providing, operations would virtually stop. GPS satellites, satellite communication satellites, we've been doing our job for years. We are the old faithful, like that Swiss army knife. We are delivering what people are looking for when they think of Space Force. Space Delta Nine provides orbital warfare and they're headquartered at Schreiber Space Force Base. Delta-9 is the orbital warfare delta, which really means that we have to provide protect and defend missions for on-orbit high-value assets. We are really concerned with, right now, uh, geosynchronous orbit, uh, which is about 22,000 miles away. Some of the weapon systems that Delta-9 use, uh, for example, is uh, uh, GSAP, it stands for Geosynchronous Space Situational Awareness Program. And what it primarily does is provide uh, neighborhood watch 
So GTAP is, is watching for other on-orbit assets within the geo belt, you know, what they're doing, what they're doing differently. And we really sort of piece that pattern of life together to paint a better picture of the geosynchronous orbit. Delta-9 operates out of Schriever Space Force Base, Colorado. We need Delta-9 because space is becoming more congested and contested every day. We are providing the security that space is starting to need. Delta-15 provides command and control. They're headquartered at Schriever Space Force Base. The mission of Delta-15 is we are the command and control Delta for the space defense mission. So the National Space Defense Center is the nation's only space defense operating center. It's a partnership between three different elements, between the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, as well as the National Reconnaissance Office. Delta-15 is a small part of the Department of Defense's portion of that partnership. The command and control piece encompasses all of our ops crews, it, it encompasses our intel community, it encompasses our cyber defense capabilities, and it encompasses our training and readiness as well as our network engineering and systems engineering support. Space Operations Command has two command and control deltas, Delta 5 and Delta 15. For Delta 5, their mission set is global space operations. For Delta 15, our mission set is space defense. Delta-15 operates from the National Space Defense Center at Schriever Space Force Base. Space defense is essentially the shield of all of our space assets, so it's our ability to protect, to guard, to defend our assets in space. You can't have a space defense mission without command and control. Delta-18 manages the National Space Intelligence Center, and they are headquartered at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Space Delta 18 is the National Space Intelligence Center. We use space for so many things, not just for the military, but also for everyday life. So NSIC provides foundational scientific and technical intelligence on foreign space systems and capabilities, as well as foreign counter space threats to US space systems. We do have two intelligence deltas. We have Delta 7 and Delta 18. So Delta 7 does uh, more of the operations intel, so the real time uh, adapting tactics to uh, adversary maneuvers. Uh, what we're doing here at NSIC is we're looking like 10, 20, 30 years out, not just to anticipate what's going to happen within the next few weeks, but to look at what technologies are being developed far in the future. And we also serve a different customer set too. As much as we're serving the operators, we're also serving the acquisitions and the policy makers too. Delta 18 operates out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. As time goes on, space is getting more complicated, it's getting more crowded. There's a lot of new and advanced technologies that are being put up into orbit, so it's really important that we're understanding what's going up into space so that we can maintain operations. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about Spock West, which is an organization that manages the Combined Force Space Component Command, overseeing the Combined Space Operations Center, and by relationship, the National Space Defense Center as well through the joint task force this is that you see on the slide. Next slide.
Next, we'll go over the space warfighting architecture. We'll start off on the right side of the chart. You can see our field commands and our organizations which we talked about during the presentation. Underneath our organizations, you'll see combat deltas. These are the presented forces from each one of our deltas that are presented to the combatant commands to be able to use in their operations. So we present those as combat deltas. On the left side of the chart is really how we do joint operations. So again, as I previously mentioned, the Combined Force Space Component Command Commander, General Chess, manages out of Vandenberg Space Force Base, and they manage directly the Combined Space Operations Center, but tangentially as well the Joint Navigation Warfare Center, Joint OPIR Center, and Missile Warning Center, as well as the Joint Task Force Space to Defense. They have coordination with them as well uh, underneath the National Space Defense Center. And all of our forces underneath Space Operations Command are presented across these organizations in order to provide capabilities to our combatant commanders. Next slide. So let's take a, a moment to talk a little bit about our, our service and our makeup. Uh, for our uniformed guardians, we've got engineers, acquisitions uh, personnel, cyber operations, space operations, as well as intelligence professionals. We tried to focus just on operations and uh, we brought over people into our service or comprise of about 8,000 active duty guardians that make up our, our service. Next slide. Airmen fuel everything that we do. Just like we mentioned previously, they provide our financial services, our HVAC, our, our power, all of the things that our bases need and our mission deltas need in order to conduct their operations comprise of about uh, 8,000 personnel across our, our deltas, our space-based deltas, led by a guardian, but completely fueled by airmen. Next slide. Lastly, civilians make up a huge part of our operations as well. There's about 8,000 civil servants that are actually absolutely integral to the way that we do operations. Next slide. Finally, partnerships. We've mentioned it previously, how integrated they are, but General Paul is a part of the Royal Canadian Air Force, but he doesn't actually operate as a liaison to Canada like most foreign officers do. He actually operates as, a, as an agent to the United States. He acts on behalf of Space Operations Command in doing his work for us. So you can't get closer of a partnership than the way that we have General Paul as a part of our operations in charge of, one, as one of our deputy commanding generals. So I briefly mentioned earlier about how we've integrated international officers in, into our operations. Space Delta II, Delta IV, Delta III, Delta VIII all have foreign officers as a part of their operations, conducting operations side by side with, with Space Force Guardians every day. And then on the right, you can see all of the other international partnerships, uh, our space catalog shared with all of our, uh, our allies uh, and to be able to provide them the same information that we have to conduct their operations. Next slide. Lastly, I'll leave you with a quote from the godfather of space and missiles, General Bernard Schriever, who, as I imagine him standing out in the middle of the field, looking up at the sky, watching Sputnik fly overhead, said several decades from now, important battles may not be sea battles or air battles, but space battles. Certainly, it's not Star Trek today or Star Wars today, the environment, but we've got a service of people focused solely on how do we operate in the space environment? And that's what space operations provides today is, is thinking about that future fight. Thank you for watching. And please, if you want more information, reach out to us on spock.spaceforce.mil or any one of our social media platforms. Thank you.